Morning, this is Sheila Duffy welcoming, welcoming you to Mesolithic Deeside Wild Things. That's us. Today we're going to look at plants and I'm joined today by June Armstrong. Who's saying Hi. hello. Morning. Ali Cameron. Hello. Ramla Fawcett. Hello. Roslyn Hay. Hi, morning. Elaine Lindsay. Morning. And Carol Reed. Good morning. So, first of all, this this whole project started because I was out and called the plant that you can see on the first slide a Carol Doddy. And that led to a great uh, conversation about uh, plants. And Ali had the notion that we might try to do something about plants. At, at the beginning, I'm going to say that we are not archaeobotanists. We are certainly, we're no kind of botanists. And a lot of the plant names escape us. Uh, we may have known them when we were in primary six and primary seven, but they've gone now. Anyway, to start off, uh, we're going to look at what Scotland might have been like after the Ice Age. And, and this is what they call a relict landscape. Um, the picture on the left is pinched from the internet, um, but the picture on the right it is an example of where there's still a piece of relic landscape left in Scotland. It's up in Invernavar, uh, up in the north coast of Scotland. It was a site of special and scientific interest, but it's had that uh, taken away from it. But here you can see my friend Hazel in amongst the dwarf hazel. And that's the whole thing about the relic landscape is that everything's dwarfed. You get dwarf juniper, dwarf plants, dwarf uh, ground plants, uh, just like when you go and climb up a hill. Uh, so that's my friend hazel in the hazel. And these are the hazelnuts who will become a recurrent theme. So I'm uh, moving on to the next slide. I think I hand over to Ali for this. So when we were thinking about doing this talk, we decided that we would look at excavations that have taken place in the area and make a list. So Sheila made a list of all the seeds and pollen that were mentioned in these sites. So at Nether Mills, um, James Kenworth, this site excavated in the 70s and 80s. At Warrenfield, the Murray's um, site with Shannon Fraser, uh, that there is already a talk on the YouTube channel about. Uh, and the Mill Timber site, which was the AWPR. Um, and again, Kirsty uh, talked about this site, so you can get more details in publications and in, in the talks. But we made a list of all the plants and we've stuck as much as possible to the plants that we know were definitely available in at this time in the northeast of Scotland and around the Dee. But there's obviously some really fantastic uh, remains that we couldn't possibly do this talk without mentioning. Um, and Rosalind's just going to talk a tiny bit about Ertzi now. Um, I was lucky enough to actually go and see Utsi when I was on holiday in Italy and the uh, finds were fantastic. But it actually took them 20 years to find his stomach. I think they found it with a new radio graphic um, technology. But they found um, ibex meat and fat, red deer and einkorn and traces of toxic fern. And that was all they found in his stomach. Um, the the fern it was either thought to be he'd ingested it for parasites but more possibly just to have wrapped his food in to carry the food and just traces had gone in his stomach um he had was carrying birch fungus which would have been used as an antibacterial possibly for parasites um which is they thought was the oldest medicine kit they'd ever found um, he had a woven mat grass, uh, a mat which was made from swamp grass, carried. Um, his clothes were made from hide and braided grass, and they were stitched together with grass fibres and tree bust. Uh, the shoes, they are fantastic, you can see them in the slide. The inner layer was string netting made from tr lime tree bast and the dry grass would have been stuffed inside. Um, the outer shoe was made from deer hide and it was tied onto his feet with bast string. Um, and he carried tinder fungus, which presumably would have been used to start fires. 
Okay. So that's... <laughs> Uh, Rosalind, you were mentioning bast there, tree bast. Yeah, it was sort of the layer under the bark. Possibly Elaine would be able to um, give more information. They would have cut it and I think they, they soaked it and then dried it and wove it together. Do you know about it, Elaine? Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's, it's, it's just inside the outer bark. And uh, they use that a lot for twisting into cordage and such like. Very strong. Okay. So I imagine that's why it would have been used in the shoes. It would have been really strong. Mm -hmm. In the mm -hmm. shoes. Yeah. And the other, I mean, the other remains that we can't possibly not mention are obviously the um, bog bodies in mainly in Denmark. One in from the north of England and various others. But uh, this is just to show fantastic pictures of well-preserved remains. I mean, we don't really have human remains, Mesolithic human remains from Scotland. Very, very few from Scotland. Nothing from the north of England. So, um, although somebody's going to give us a talk about Mesolithic remains in the future. Uh, but this is just to show what you can find out if you've got really good preservation, which we don't have in this area of Scotland. And so then just very briefly, um, the evidence that we've had, so I was mentioning that we had the three sites that we looked at and listed. So these are some of the points that we have from the Warren Field excavations, and we're going to talk about them in more detail later. The Milton excavation, again, there's a range of different trees and plant remains. As Sheila said, hazelnuts occur everywhere uh, and at nether mills too, mainly, mainly tree um, remains. I think, Ali, what's important to say at this point is that these are the excavations that we know about and there's actually very scant evidence within the archaeological excavations of the actual plants that were there. Some of these are quite... Um, you, there's small traces. For example, I think the violet, was it a violet at um, Warren Field was something like tiny, tiny seed pod or something. So, really, it's not hugely uh, convincing sometimes on its own what comes from the excavations. But probably what's more convincing is what comes from the D side pollen records, where they're able to take a, a core down through, is it maybe through peat mostly, uh, or, or through soil, and then take it out and look at the contents under a microscope. And that's where they found these examples that are now on the screen. Uh, examples of stuff that you can still find uh, going out and about today. Um, so the, I, the, the one that fascinates me is the horse tail. Because that is our mare's tail on a tether. It's the most basic of botanical structure, I think. It's, it's much more basic than anything else there. So it's presumably been around a long time and long time before man. The interesting thing about pollen is that it can travel a long distance, of course. So when you're looking at these pollen cores, you're looking at an area, you know, quite a big hundred kilometres or whatever area around... Um, the, the core, whereas with seeds, they don't go too far. So when you're finding seeds, particularly things like charred seeds within a pit on an excavation, you you know that they've been in a very close proximity to that pit and probably incorporated into the pit, you know, maybe as discard from a meal or from processing or... Um, but we were looking at obviously a different, quite a big range of uh, evidence here, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. The bog battle as well is something that... Um... Queen Victoria, we know she had it in her hat when she went uh, up at Balmoral to keep away the midges, seemingly. <laughs> I don't think anybody else has cottoned on that one. <laughs> well, it hasn't yeah. been that's a midge it's repellent. Yes, it's an insect repellent. We're also used to put it in bride bouquets to keep the flat the, the um, midges away in okay. Iceland. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So the other thing that we have record of is from SCARF. Uh, Ali, you tell us what SCARF stands for, Scottish Research Archaeological Framework. That's it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are all examples of things that we know are in the Scotland record. 
Um, the, the juniper is there quite early, and it's one of the things that you get in the relic landscape, the dwarf juniper. Uh, we had a bit of debate. And daisies, isn't that nice? Daisies have been here all that time. But whether <laughs> it's like that or not, I don't know. And we had a big debate about reed mace, because I didn't know that reed mace was um, bulrushes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Or, or cat's one. tails sometimes. What is it called? Cat's tail. Tails. Cat's tails. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, but from this side, you can see we have a far bigger range of uh, potential plants that may have been may have been in this side during the Mesolithic. Even plants that were deliberately brought onto Mesolithic sites by humans may have been collected for other purposes. Most wild plants have many potential non-edible uses. They may be used as medicines, cosmetics, toys, or for dyeing, bedding, construction, tools, fuel, bedding, cordage, utensils, basketry, and hunting poisons. And some species might have become deposited on archaeological sites as a result of these activities. And I think that's the really nice phrase, obviously, that comes from this publication. That, uh, and this is what we're going to be talking about now, isn't it? We're going to all um, talk a little bit about these different uses of plants. So, June, are you going this to talk is... about the edible plants? Well, yes, I'll, I'll um, have a, a run through of some of these. Uh, the cleavers uh, that we we know as sticky willy as well, um, they can be uh, added to soups and stews. Um, and the tender, the young tender shoots can be boiled and buttered and just used as, as, a, as a side vegetable. And the seeds can also be ground into uh, Powdered uh, and, and you can make a cleaver's coffee apparently. But, oh, wow. um, that's <laughs> that's quite amazing. <laughs> but whether that's something that you know the Mesolithic um, people would have done or not, I I, I don't know. I, I don't know at, at what point that might have um, been discovered. Um, you can also make a tonic, a spring tonic um, from cleavers. Yeah. If you soak them overnight in cold water, because you, you, hot water would destroy the, the the helpful properties, but if you make an infusion overnight, you can use it as a cleansing uh, tonic, apparently. Okay. So it's um, and obviously once you've heated the the the, the cleavers, the uh, the stickiness, you know, the, the sort of. Um, but the sticky things sort of uh, break down and you know they, they become quite edible um the celandine the lesser celandine there um again that's a, a, a the milder spring leaves can be used um but you you've got to be careful with them they they, they can be they can sort of aggravate um health issues so you you, you can't eat them you can't eat too much at a time. Um, again, you can use them as a pot herb, which I, I think would be similar to the, the cleavers. You would add them to soups and stews and so on. Um, and they, they also have little bulbils, uh, little tubers in the roots there that um, they can be boiled or roasted and you know added to salads and things. But again, is that how the Mesolithic people would have used them? I, I don't know. See, I, um, Jim, when you're speaking about that, I remember watching some, because we've all been doing our studying for this, watching the Ray Mears uh, versions of him being with the Aboriginal uh, people. And mm -hmm. they use a lot of the undergrowth, the tubers and the roots uh, and the yeah. plants they come from. So I, I have no doubt that the Mesolithic people would have um, understood that there were the, the plant, the parts of the plants actually sometimes are more nutritious on the bits that are underground rather than the bits that are on top. 
Yeah, well, that would have provided them with the starchiness that they needed. The car, you know, the carbohydrate yeah, would have exactly. come come from the roots. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I was reading something recently about um, the very few carbohydrates. They think in like the Paleolithic diet, and so very few caries. You know, rotten teeth. <laughs> Whereas by the time you got to the Mesolithic, the, the teeth that they found, 20% of them had um, caries of some sort. And they think that's because they were introducing these sort of sweet and carbohydrates into their diet. Wow. It's like, yeah, okay. It's rotten. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So it's great, June. I mean, we don't know that they did these processes, but we certainly no. they would have known the health properties and the, you know, edible um, qualities mm. of these plants. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, a very early man obviously just ate raw food, you know, before they actually discovered how to make fire, everything would have been, been eaten raw, raw. but apparently um, first evidence of fire um, came about 1.2 million years, between 1.2 million and 800,000 years ago. So obviously, um, fire was up, uh, you know, very much used in Mesolithic time. But co cooked food also provides more energy, apparently, and they reckon that cooking may be linked to the rapid increase in brain size. Ooh. Um, I'll remember that when I'm standing over the cooker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm increasing my brain size. <laughs> it's actually probably too late, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> so what about fat? It's June. It's a very, very common plant, that isn't it? In in. The... Sorry, Ali, I didn't catch that. Fat hen is a very, very common. Fat hen, yeah. <laughs> Is it? It's um, I actually have it growing in my. I, I have all of these. Um, <laughs> what if we would class as weeds growing in my garden? I have the fat hen, the sticky relays, the dock, and the ferns, and well, in fact, the plantain as well. They all grow here, and I've never eaten any of them. It's uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's been quite a revelation realizing that I can. I could actually stop going to Tesco and um, just get my vegetables fr from the garden. I wouldn't um, recommend it, June. I wouldn't recommend it. I haven't tasted some. Good, good <laughs> coincidentally, coincidentally, just last week, a friend of mine who, who's not connected to Mesolithic Tea's side um, made uh, ground elder pecora. Mm. And she she actually oh. um, sent some down for me, and they were very tasty. But I mean, it could have been any green leaf. It could have been spinach. You I mean you couldn't tell that you know it was ground elder. But I mean, I yeah. ate it, and I'm and I'm still here. I survived. <laughs> I like this. The, the one of the books I looked at showed that fat hen was in Gaelic, was or Gaelic. We better say it properly. Yeah. Gaelic, mm -hmm. um, known as lazy man kale. So, okay. so it was something that you didn't have to grow; it grew itself, and you used you could use it as kale. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was quite interesting that, as because that's only going back a century, I would think mm -hmm. uh, that that's still being used anyway. I presume it was called fat hen because it was used to feed poultry, to fatten up poultry. Because oh, it's yeah. actually called it's actually mm -hmm. called goose foot because it's shaped like a goose foot, the leaf. Mm -hmm. So I no, presume no, no. Fat, fat hen came from the fact that you would have used it to fatten up your poultry, would it? it makes know. sense. Quite possibly, yeah. 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 But I don't know. I'm just saying. We know up. what dock and leaves can be used for. Is <laughs> 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 well, not going to that here. <laughs> well, yes, uh, actually, do dock dockens, as is, uh, is, is, um, I, I know them, have many many uses the young leaves can be cooked like spinach mm. um, the seeds can actually be boiled into a mush uh, like a porridge type um, dish or uh, ground up and added to flour um, again I don't know if this is something that Mesolithic people would have done the, the young stems can be chopped up and, and sweetened with honey um, and used uh, as a substitute for rhubarb um and they they they've got a very high uh, vitamin c content 
also vitamin A, more, more than oranges and carrots. And they, there's vitamins B1 and B2 and also iron that you can all get from eating docks. So they're, you know, that, that's a, an amazing food source, really. Mm -hmm. and what and that's, that's, the nice lady fern, what does it do? That's its own lady fern from her own garden. Yeah, well, the, again, this is that you can cook the young shoots, the, the little fiddlehead shoots um, okay. can, can be uh, before they've unfurled properly, they, they can be cooked in, in, the, in the springtime. But there's a comment there that says it's a, a, a bitter emergency food. <laughs> so, you know, you can, you can cook it like asparagus, but obviously it's something that you might only only want to eat if you were sort of short of everything else. But again, the root, the rhizome, um, it can be baked in the fire embers again and then peeled and you can eat the starchy, um, mm. starchy in, inside content. So, uh, you know, I, again, I maybe will try try and get round to sampling all of these things out of the garden. <laughs> There's enough evidence to say that I'm not going to sort of uh, expire. I mean, it's quite interesting to think how they started to eat these. They would have all been growing around. They would have picked bunches of them, maybe eaten them raw or cooked them. And how did they work out what these ones were poisonous and not or not? Um, well, yes, that's an interesting point, Ali. You know, did someone have to die for them to realise that something was poisonous, or you know, did they? Or just get just a stomach little cake. Sorry. Or just get a really bad stomach ache. Maybe they tasted small amounts of it. Yeah. And didn't feel well, then they didn't eat it again. <laughs> no, that's it's, it's interesting how plant knowledge came about. You know, how, how instinctive it was, or how learned. Yes, absolutely, yeah. I mean, if we move on to the next slide, Carol's going to talk us a bit through so this is the sort of medicinal uses of some of these plants that um, we know. Yeah, I think it's fantastic um, to learn as we've been going along um, what some of the medicinal qualities um, the plants that we have even around today actually have. From the research that we did for um, Warrenfield, Mill Timber, Nether Mills, the plants that um, we learned about that was available then and some of them still available now was just as was mentioned before, fat hen. That was used, the, the large leaves were used as a focus to soothe burns. Um, the daisy, as um, Betty mentioned earlier, um, that was to heal wounds and uh, stiff joints um, if given as a drink, um, a tea infusion. Um, Bilberry, as you see on the slide there, um, that one was for vascular problems, uh, things like hemorrhoids, varicose veins, also for eye treatments, gout, diabetes, osteoarthritis, obviously, uh, for joints. Again, given as a drink, a leave infusion um, for sore throats and respiratory uh, complaints. I think, Carol, uh, you saying that about being used, bilberry being used for hemorrhoids, we kind of forget that mesolithic man would have oh, the same sort that. of minor medical problems that we oh, have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh-huh. Um, dandelion, common dandelion, uh, was a, a diuretic, you know, a detox for the blood, the kidney, the liver, the white sap also cures warts if you put it on warts. Um, but mostly for urinary disorders, they would have had that too. Um, willow bark, as you see on one of the slides, was a painkiller um, for sore muscles, for headaches, um, cold flus. It also even helped weight loss. I'm not sure how they did that, but it could cause stomach upset if taken too often. So that's where you can see some things coming in where you could take something maybe three times a day and that was the limit, um, <laughs> or it would upset your stomach. Um, so we're learning anyway. Meadowsweet was mentioned earlier, and that has got uh, uh, salicylic acid, and that's actually where we first discovered aspirin for headaches and, and joint pains and so on. Um, some of these ones that I'm mentioning actually are used today and they're in the top 100 as far as the World Health, Health Organization is concerned. 
they're still used. In fact, the World Health Organization tell us that 80% of our um, medicine nowadays is plant-based. Hmm. Things know. like bog myrtle that we'd mentioned uh, is, um, we'd mentioned earlier, an insect repellent, as you've mentioned, um, Sheila, um, we'd put in bride's bouquets, but it was also essential for acne. The oil was used for acne, but pregnant women weren't allowed to consume it. So there was obviously a, a link there um, that they learned not to only be used in certain purposes um, for certain people. Cleavers, these sticky, woolly things that drive us daft, is actually a, a, a diuretic uh, for the lymph glands. And it also eases constipation. Um, it's great to think that something that's so annoying like these sticky willies actually have a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, burdock, an anti-inflammatory. Um, things like, just common things like mint. We used it as a body scrub, a deodorant. Um, the scabious, I think we'd mentioned, I think there's a photograph of it there. Um, the roots were used for coughs and sore throats. Um, bronchitis, any sort of things like that. The leaves were used actually to dye wool, someone had mentioned earlier. It dyed wool a lovely green, um, mm. so that was used for that. But it was also used to treat scabies, um, any sort of mites, any severe itching, it would take the heat out of um, itching. Uh, as that well. seems to be a common theme between what uh, Rosalind was speaking about. The roots, the roots. Yeah. Uh, it's about mites and infestations and things yeah. like that. Quite a yeah. lot of stuff. So making us all scratch, thinking of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you wonder, Carol. You wonder, Carol, if there was somebody who knew about all of this, you know, within each group, or whether, you know, how whether there was like a medicine person. Um, I think it would be taught, you know, everybody. If you, if we look at it from the point of view that we have learned that when we think about mesolithic. Um, Hunters gatherers, they're eating berries and fruit roundabout as they wander, and they're, they're uh, killing animals uh, for meat. Children would have been picking things off of, of bushes and so on. There would have to have been an early, you know, teaching, um, you know, from, you know, uh, you know like first eyes onwards to be able to recognise what was dangerous, as you'll go mm -hmm. on to speak to in a minute, the poisonous, and what was actually edible or actually what was used to be able to help them, whether they had a cut or, or so on. An example would be lichen, which is still about today, obviously. Um, we're told that that was used for... Um, or old man's beard, as it's sometimes called as well, that that's got the properties of um, being able to be uh, to hold water or any fluid um, five times greater than a bit of cotton wool. So mm -hmm. it's used for wounds and things like that, to pack them, to be able to, to soak up um, things. And also I would think for you know, any sort of ulcers, ulcerated skin or anything like that um, as well. Um, nettles were used for arthritis. They would actually make a poultice and, and and put it around the joints. So from very early on, it's been used for its stinging quality. Um, from that point of view, although it's been used for other things, um, like making string and, and different things like that. But that was uh, the medicinal. There's a, a lot more, um, you know, different ones. Most of the ones that I've mentioned are in the top 100 still used today uh, for medicinal purposes. In fact, um, some of them are even um, advertised in the SES survival guide for people who are stranded mm -hmm. and uh, you know, have to use the wildlife to be able to feed themselves or to um, keep themselves healthy and well until they're discovered. And all of these ones that, that you've been talking about, Carol, that are on our record, aren't they? They're on our list. Uh -huh. so, yeah, so they've been there all the time, uh, all that time. I think it too is important that we recognise the importance of the oral tradition, you know, like passing down the stories um, yeah. it would have been the way that they would have done it for the kids. And I think um, one of the things that I certainly learned from one of the Ray Moyers, um, them years uh, videos, um, was when it was Aborigine people. The Aborigine people were saying that to take one of us 
out into their wilderness. It's like taking someone blind because we don't see what they know as far as the pharmacy. It's on their own. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that, it's that's all important it. because it, it then moves on to the, the things that are not so good for us. <laughs> Poisons! Yeah, there must, really yeah. there must be a really fine line between, you know, a medicine and poison and um, what we were talking about before, about how you actually find that out. I mean, things like vetch, the seeds are incredibly toxic and you have to you have to boil them, you know, treat them like, like you would do red kidney beans or whatever today. Um, I mean, holly, uh, very poisonous berries. You can imagine the kids picking the berries and trying them and maybe not a happy ending. But then mm -hmm. maybe the group would then say, well, those are, you know, those are not to be eaten. You would see the juice of the holly around the mouth and, you know, maybe not uh, eat them again. I mean, buttercup, um, it says not to be consumed by children and pregnant women. Um, the leaves are toxic unless they're boiled. But I mean, it's a very, very toxic, um, even if you treat them and boil them and, and they're still toxic. Um, and the roots and seeds of the violet are also toxic. So you can imagine these, you know, them, them trying these out and realising that, you know, they just couldn't be used for anything um, at all, couldn't be eaten or used for... Um, but are any of them actually lethal? I mean, it sounds like if you weren't very well... Um, I mean, we're not sure how healthy the people in Mesolithic northeast of Scotland were. If they'd been mm -hmm. quite healthy, they would probably fought this off. But something like holly berries, you know, if you eat quite a lot of them and you're not actually brilliantly healthy in the first place, or maybe a child, a pregnant woman, an older person, then yes, they could have been, absolutely could have been fatal, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, this was just nice... Um, pictures put in here you know obviously we've got lots of evidence of um these different um things like ergot the fungi in gravel man's stomach and um whether they they actually killed these people i think with tollum man had a few things in his stomach but he also had a rope around his neck as uh, elaine said it's a, a leather strap around his neck so um we're not quite sure he could have been killed in several different ways So we'll move on to Elaine and the cordage. Yeah. Well, this sort of started for me um, a couple of years ago. I think I think Ali was talking to me out in a field when we were field walking. And um, I'm a straw worker, so I'm used to using natural materials for my work. But Ali asked if I had ever made nettle cordage. And not only had I never made nettle cordage, I'd actually never heard of nettle cordage. But that sent me on a, a path, really, to uh, discover a whole heap of, of different ways of making cordage. Um, so I started with the nettles, and you can see in the photographs here, really the process, because in my eyes, nettles were a stingy plant. I'd heard that they could be eaten. I knew that people would do nettle tea and nettle soup and that um, type of thing. Um, but actually making something from the net, from the nettles, I had no idea. But actually, I've come to love it. Um, and I really enjoy the preparation of the material. And I could quite easily imagine people getting their materials ready for cordage. And you'll see here in the, the top left slide um, that what I've done is I've harvested the nettle and I've taken the leaves off. And in that process, it gets rid of the stingy hairs as well. Now, I'm a wee bit um, cowardice, so I do use a glove to, to remove the, 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 um, the leaves. But I don't think they would have had gloves in those days. Um, but they could have maybe used something like a docking leaf, for example. No. Because well, that's, that's I, I, I know that yeah. some folks say, yeah, I mean, I know that folks say, oh, but, you know, they were hardy to the stings. But if you were preparing the number of nettles that you need for a long piece of cordage, I think your hands would be pretty sore at the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the other thing, and looking back to the Ray Mears um, uh, videos that we've all been really watching, um, they talked about wafting the, the nettles over the fire, which got rid of the stingy hairs, and then they could eat the nettle leaves. Yes, so did yeah. they sit at the fire and do that? and eat the leaves and then make their cordage with the stems. I don't know. Um, but 
anyway, we, we want to remove the leaves. And then I use a, well, I use a stick and a, a just a, a flat stone when I'm demonstrating. I found to begin with, I used two stones and it was too heavy. It was really breaking up the fibres too much. But what I'm actually doing, especially at the leaf joints, is putting a little bit of pressure on with the stick. I often say to folk, bash it gently, and that sounds wrong. Um, but you want to, to squash it a little bit. And then I use my thumbnail to split the, the nettle. And you see this, the nettle being split in the top right picture. And all that light green pith that's in the middle of the nettle needs to be removed. So in the bottom left picture, you see the, the fibres on the left hand side and the woody pithy stem on the right hand side. Um, um, now, at this time of the year, so we're speaking about early summer, the nettles are almost a bit too soft for this. I prefer to wait until it's a little bit later in the summer before I harvest them. It's still possible to do it just now, but it's difficult to get the, the pithy inner um, taken out. Once I've got my fibre, which is what you see bottom left, and it's in, that's the piece that's in my hand, and that's the piece that's going to make the cordage, but I don't tend to use it right then. What I prefer to do is to leave it to dry out slightly because it shrinks a, a, a huge amount and that makes your cord very springy and actually it's not so strong. So I like to let it dry out a little bit first before I start twisting it, which you see the, the result of that on the bottom right hand side. But once I established that I could do this, I've got on and experimented with grasses, um, bulrushes, rushes, um, even dandelion stems, and they will all make really strong cordage. In fact, just yesterday, I don't know if you can see on the screen there, this is a little piece of rope, um, grass rope that I plaited just in the 100 yards before I came home um, yesterday from my walk. I just pulled the grass from the side of the, the road and made the cord. And you could imagine folk moving about making this cord you only need short lengths of grass so you can keep adding to the cord as well so you wouldn't have to make you know yards of it for a long period of time so a lot Hello. of the plants that we spoken about today work well yes Sheila Ellen, would they be able to store like uh, grass let's say you needed some cordage for clothing or something like that uh, but in the winter time you wouldn't have the grasses or the nettles or anything would they be able to dry and store or what do you think well yeah i definitely think two uh, two things i've thought about one i think the like i said with the nettle i prefer to use it when it's dried out slightly and maybe then mm -hmm. dampen it just to make it fly uh, yeah. um mm -hmm. also you would once you'd made the cord and you could make it when the plants were fresh tie it up on a stick or something, like making a ball of string, and then you could mm -hmm. carry that with you as well, carry it in your pocket and things. So yeah. it definitely would be something you could use right throughout the year. But they would mm -hmm. have known the times of year to harvest all these things when yeah. it would be best. Yeah. Yeah. And then, would, and certainly, you know, once it's dry, it'll keep indefinitely. I have nettle cordage from my first batch of nettle cordage, and I still have it, and it's just as good as, as it was when I made it. So that's a couple of years old. Um, and when, we, but, when we've uh, gone to the shows, it, it's been a very popular uh, at the shows. The, um, the next slide shows us that how popular nettle making has been um, when we move on to the next slide. But we've kind of got stuck on this slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> I think I think what, what's um, come out uh, of the sections we've been talking about is how just the general public really are now removed from this knowledge, this this closeness to the earth and to nature. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. we've lost very much so. You know? Yeah, but but yet there seems to be a desire for it, as you say, Sheila. Oh, pe pe people are really quite excited and interested in doing these sort of uh, crafts, skills, whatever, you know, it's almost as I if there's a, a, a latent thing there. 
interesting to me was that everybody could try it. You know, kids could do it. Uh, yes. People yeah. could do it. it. There wasn't uh, any limits on who could sit and, and it's quite therapeutic to sit and do something like that too. Definitely, something the family Definitely. could do sitting around the fire of an evening or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of just right. something productive. And these things would have, these things would have gone on for a, a, a long, long time. You know, um, I know in the early twentieth century they were certainly making grass ropes to make horse halters and and that yeah. type of thing um you know so it's it was a skill that just was passed down for thousands of years really mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and and then uh, we move on now to uh basketry which is sort of a grander or bigger version of much the same thing but it's about using the resources that we have the first photograph in here um it's actually taken down on the day just last week. And you can see, or the two, first two photographs, you can see how um, invasive willow actually is. It's almost like a weed that grows up the side of the tea. And in the middle photograph, it was just an area that was a stony area of the uh, on the bank of the tea that's just been totally con colonized by um, the willow. But it's not in the same straight form as the next picture which shows Bremela mm -hmm. uh, uh, when we're gathering willow because it was it was Bremela was very straight wasn't it all day uh, we didn't have not any bits to deal with or anything like that no no they were very long and straight it was very easy for us to to find what we needed there the willow withies the, the strong straight flexible willow stems that are good for for making into baskets or fish traps as we were wanting to, to make for the avoiding games there. Um, this The first photo um, shows a fish trap that Carol actually made. Um, it was a prototype, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it a... Of, it wasn't made of, um, you know, willow. Um, it was just a prototype where um, nearby, I had some um, willow herb growing, not a native to this um, to Scotland, but it was strong and it was um, straight. So I thought I would um, just practice uh, to make a, a fish trap. I uh, had been to Orkney uh, to Scarabray and knew that they fished there, but I thought, how do we catch fish if you're um, inland? Um, how do you catch fish in rivers? And I'd went online and uh, watched a video that showed us how to do it. Um, so I made that prototype, uh, used um, some garden twine, um, tied it in the water um, in the local burn, uh, the Belty Burn. Um, but when I took it out of the water and it dried, the willow herb um, shrunk and that loosened the twine. So it wasn't mm -hmm. effective for long term use, um, only in the short term. So then we looked at um, being able to get con make contact with a farmer who had willow and we could go and pick some of the stronger um, willow um, whippets and also some of the, at the right time of year to be able to pick some soft ones that we could bend to be able to put into circles to be able to elongate um, and open up the fish trap. But even gathering the willow was an interesting experience in the sort of farmed versions of it today, because it, it really is very um, vigorous, that would be the way you would describe it. It's something that really grows, and it was grown uh, locally, it's been grown locally for a biomass um, heating plant was the, the purpose that it had been farmed, wasn't it, Pramla? Yes, I think so, yeah. Yes, and, and is is, is this um, sorry, Premla? The, the, oh. Just wondering, is this a, a specific species of willow that that just grows long, straight stems, or is it is it the way that they farm it? Do, do you happen to know? It's been pollarded. This particular plantation was pollarded. Ah, so right. That, okay. Yeah. So it's that's why it's so easy to collect it because there's just all straight stems. Oh, um, okay. Of, I don't know, it was cut, was it about a metre, metre high, it had all been... Yeah, so, I mean, it's relatively a straightforward um, exercise for us to go and, and, and cut 
get gathered yeah. below. But when you see the pictures of it on the D and you see it growing naturally, it wouldn't have been maybe quite so easy. No. <laughs> but maybe, yeah. maybe they pollarded it as well. Oh, you know, well. They maybe cut it down and then it grew straight. Yes, maybe. So, yeah. And it's maybe just that it's just growing wild now and nobody's touching it, that, that mm -hmm. you're getting all the branches from it. Well, that's it. They, they would have learned as they went along, Eli, and they, you know, one year they would mm -hmm. have cut it and maybe come back the next year and realise yeah. they had mm -hmm. the, the longer, straighter yeah. stems. So, again, it's just a learning experience. But mm -hmm. both uh, shows where we've um, done this, the... Um, well, I haven't done it. <laughs> um, it's been, people have really got interested. Similarly with the nettle, making the string, they love seeing and they love looking at how people, how these are constructed. And at the end of it, you've got a product. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if the yeah. fish and gillies on the D would be too happy with it. But... <laughs> <laughs> But it brings the history to life. Yeah. Sorry, Pramila. I'm just saying it brings it picture. all to life for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This, this um, is a funnel trap um, in the picture here. It's got two parts. You've got the main body, the cone shape, and then you have an inverted cone, um, which fits on the top like a lid. And the fish <laughs> swim into the cone, the inverted cone, um, and then they can't find their way out again. Sim very simple. Yeah. Uh, but clever as well. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever caught anything, Pamela? I caught our kitten once when I was trying to make <laughs> 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 it. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that I, I assume that they maybe caught eels and that as well, would they? Fish and, yeah, and eels, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, did any of you see the Ray Mears one with the Aborigine uh, ladies? And they had a cone, just just exactly, just like this, but they were just holding it at the top and pushing it down on top of the fish. They were yeah. walking through the river, yeah. and they, um, they just kind of caught the, the fish within the cage, if you like. Yeah. Okay, no, what, what, was interesting to me, what was interesting to me was um, when I was learning how to do it um, on the, by the video on the internet, that this method is still used in Asian countries today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tried mm -hmm. and tested. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well, the middle... Is that your daughter there? Hmm? Was that your daughter helping you there as well? Okay, playing games, yes. She yes. was helping to do it, yeah. She, she was quite taken with the process as well, was she? Yes, well, it was, well partly because it needed two of us. <laughs> 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 you on your own, <laughs> trying to hold the stems and yes, yeah. bind. But at the Aboyne Games, we actually used some of Elaine's nettle strings. To, um, oh, right, yes, OK. Together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So should we move to the Doric? This is we've obviously talked about different names for plants, and um, Rosalind was going to say a little bit about some of these names and pronounce them properly. Uh, well, I can't really say much about them, but um, sorrel we would know as surex, just because it is sour. I don't know if anybody's ever tasted sorrel, but it is very sour. Yeah. Yes. Maybe, I mean, I've tasted dandelions as well, and they are absolutely disgusting, so I don't know. Um, the sticky willy, I don't really know. I presume it just got its name from you stuck it on somebody's back. Um, it gives me the willy, it gives me the willies when I touch it, that horrible feeling. So maybe that's where the, the sticky willy bit came up. It is horrible when it sticks on your skin. It's, it's horrible. Know. I was actually clearing it yesterday, and it's oh, it just it makes me just go really funny when I touch it. So maybe that's where the sticky, the willy bit comes. Yeah. I don't know. It gives you the I like, yeah. I, like, I like both of these photographs here because one's taken off the internet from another part of Scotland, but one is uh, actually Premela's uh, family, and it's 
I like the other two people in it because they they know perfectly well that that's sticking on his back. <laughs> tell him, I to tell him. We used to do that's a like primary school, and um, it used to be that see how long it would take somebody. You know, you stick that on realize. the play time yeah. and see if it was still there at dinner time. Yeah. <laughs> it's a learning situation. Uh, <laughs> the fun. The well, we would say Skyla here, but Skyla. I think it's it's got different different pronunciations in various places. But that's what my dad would have said. It's mm. a it's a wild mustard. Um, so I'm just sort of speaking as a farmer's daughter, and it, it's a very invasive plant. So you wouldn't want it growing in your barley or your corn crop because obviously the seeds would get mixed in and they would be replanted again the following year if you were replanting the seeds mm -hmm. um and possibly i thought fat hen is the same it's um another really invasive plant and would have been if it was growing in your crop you would try to get rid of it so i sort yeah, of presumed well, that um that's when they became weeds instead of being food because it was so much easier to plant neeps and cabbage and stuff and you wouldn't want this invasive plant in them on your crop mm -hmm. so you would have thrown it away rather than eat it again mm -hmm. so the mesolithic man wouldn't have had these worries no, no that's, that's right. true yeah <laughs> but yeah, that's just... why we've probably forgotten that you can actually eat these things because uh, there's, yeah. there's much better alternatives now yeah. um well, the rodin tree, I presume everybody knows it's called rodin, do they? Or is it just, I presume. <laughs> I, I, I don't tree? know. Is, is that a Doric? <laughs> is that just in the Doric? Or is it is it Scotland wide, the rodin for the rowan? I don't know. <laughs> it's certainly, I've always known up, it as rodin. Uh, up this corner, it's rodin. Well, I think it was was one of the ones mentioned possibly being around, wasn't it, Sheila? It's on the oh, list, so yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's <laughs> edible, and you can make you can make jam and things like that. But it'd be very bitter, and you'd have to know how to cook it before you could actually eat it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it makes some nice jelly. Yeah, makes nice jelly to go with game. Um, there's a lot of folklore about rodent trees. Um, obviously, the witch one being the favourite. Mm. You would. Um, plant a rowan tree down on the farm or something it'd be very unlucky if you cut a rowan tree down um and of but course the, they're, a, they're a bit they're an indicator supposedly for the winter ahead if they're the berries if there's loads of berries on the rowan tree it's supposed to be a bad winter coming up oh i've heard that uh, rosalind yeah. yeah but what's interesting about that as well is that it can be made into a musical instrument yeah, they're very good for carving, and it would also be used mm -hmm. for uh, making walking sticks and um, spindles, things like that. Yeah, and I also found out now. Here's a good bit: Druids use the bark and berries to dye garments worn during lunar ceremonies black, and the bark was also used. The bark was used in the tanning process. And rowan, rowan twigs were used for divining, particularly for metals. All right. Yeah, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And what about your other things down here, grass and yes. here? Well, grass is just grass. Grass is All right. just a name for grass. Hairy witches, well, I'm, I'm really not sure where it comes. It's supposed to be used in Aberdeen. Um, but obviously not around these parts. My husband's mom um, was a toonser, as we would say. Um, <laughs> she would have she would have called them hairy witches, and it, apparently, you, I think when you blew them, if you caught a seed, it was good luck. But I, I think I remember life. from Montrosia dear, uh, hairy witches as being a, a, a name down yeah. there. A lot of the stuff that's Doric up here doesn't travel that distance down to Montrose. It never used to travel down to Montrose. It's only a distance of 40 miles. But it's an indicator too of how local a lot of knowledge and language is today. Uh -huh. yeah. and it must have also been the same, you would think, 
for groups of people who were together, uh, that group would have had its own sort of language methods of communication as well. Yeah. Yeah. The names for things. Yeah. So should we move on? We were talking. We sort of mm -hmm. touched on games then, but Sheila's going. Yeah. To well, the, the the kind of the 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 whistle thing makes you think about all the different other kind of aspects you can use um, plants for, like I, I and. Because they reckon that in the Mesolithic time people would have had actually more time to do things, children would certainly have played. Adults would have probably played as well, because uh, I think you find that throughout all humanity that play, and animals, they play. So looking at some of the things that are around uh, in the Mesolithic, the, the grasses and, and sedges and all these sort of bulrushy things, they make fantastic arrows and spears if you're playing. You can chuck them at each other and you can jab folk with them. Uh, <laughs> lots of different uses. And the other use for them is to do boaties. Now, I would imagine they would have played boaties. Do you guys play boaties? Or do you call oh. it? Boaties with Dawkins. Yes, we did. We did. You used to th right. thre thread, fold it over, but thread the stem through the, you know, tear a little bit through the leaf, fold the stem through, and make make it so it looked like a little boat with a sail. That's very posh. Beautiful <laughs> <laughs> boat is. We just put the stick down. Well, usually at a bridge or something, and then you it went like what folk call who sticks these days. Oh, but oh, oh, it was, right. boat okay. is, was just. You drop oh. it at one side of the bridge and you go at the other side and see who's come through oh. first. Oh, yeah. We would have made a proper boat with docking leaves, Sheila. Oh, for goodness. <laughs> you were sophisticated. <laughs> sophisticated <laughs> folk up here. Anyway, <laughs> and there's the, the, I love the French name for um, dandelion, which as, is pisson lit, which means went to bed. <laughs> and <laughs> and that, that dandelion was a diuretic. But, the, I mean, I they wouldn't have had clocks, so they wouldn't have been using um, dandelions to blow to tell the time, because that's what we used, we used to do, was blow the dandelion at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Yes. Yeah. Seven, 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 seven. It was but, never very so, accurate, was it, Sheila? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> there is some theory about it, about about the moisture in the air and different times of the day that it might, that might work a wee bit. But... The, the thing about the, the witches, um, what did you call them, Rosalind? The hairy witches. Hairy witches and the good luck. And uh, you could imagine kids playing at that. And then we come to the Carol Doddies, which started all this off. Um, the come full um, circle. Yeah, which is knocking off the head, that, you know, with each other and, and being competitive. And I think they probably were competitive. The other one that we had was a lot of, uh, I'm not sure if it was around in the Mesolithic, but the um, rose hip was sticking down folks' back as itchy coo. Uh, yeah. It felt yeah. really itchy. Yeah. Itchy uh, seeds. Yeah, and daisy chains. But the one, I'm going to try and demonstrate this now, but I'm not sure that it's going to work, is to make music with grass, or well, you make a noise with it. My thumbs don't do this anymore, but you get a bit of blade of grass like that, stick it between your thumbs and, well, it didn't work, and blow. <laughs> <laughs> and you can get a high-pitched whistle, different sounds coming out of, um, out of that. As it vibrates. I, I have the same problem as you nowadays, Sheila. My thumbs don't go together either. I, no. I tried... I tried doing whistle blowing, uh, grass blowing uh, recently, and it just it doesn't work for me now. It doesn't work. I know you need young thumbs or, or <laughs> some cure for arthritis or whatever. Yeah. Well, you need to get the nettle poultices that Carol was talking uh, about. Well, if we move on to the next slide, I'll I'll keep trying, and you might get a high pitched squeak in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because that, that leads us on to, well, the things we haven't talked about here is the, the, there's a whole range of other things. There's the use of trees, the use of fungi, the use of animals. There's a whole chunk of other things that come under the ambit of, 
of um, wild things. We've really just touched on the surface today. Um, this is the horse's hoof fungus, which is certainly very, I mean, you can go up the woods and, and still get them today. Um, mm -hmm. It's for tinder and antiseptic purposes. A lot of the fungi have lots of different purposes. But I think that's probably we've done enough for today and we'll leave that one for another time. Uh, we'll have some birch sap wine now. Pardon? <laughs> we'll go and have a wee drop of birch sap wine now. <laughs> <laughs> These are just photographs that people gave me that I didn't use and I just thought we'll just put them in because the campion was there and um, the wood sorrel is my one, I like that one. There's um, Rosalind's own photograph of Otsi and Otsi's mummy. <laughs> 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 so they're just they're just for a little and so if you'd like to find out more these are all the places and all the links you can um get more information do you want to put on um the information about the publication grow your own drugs if folk wanted to try some of the plants in their garden well you can just say that now carol yeah uh, because i lists so that you've you've done it. <laughs> Grow your own drugs. Tells you all the things about them and their, their you know properties. Yeah, I, I think what uh, Carol's saying is there, there are actually lots and lots of different resources available as we found yeah. when we've been. Uh, SES survival guide. <laughs> Another one that's very really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I must have. Well, that, that's that's everything from us today, I think. So we'll just say um thank you very much for listening and hope you've learned something out of this. We certainly have. We're still not botanists, but we know a little <laughs> bit more than we did about uh three. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay. Everybody, bye bye. 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 bye.